What's up, everybody? Welcome to Gojo and Golik. Mike Golik Jr., Mike Golik Sr., and Claudia Bellafato, our friend back in the DraftKings studio, holding it down in Boston. We got a great show for you guys today. As always, make sure you download, subscribe, rate, review us, leave us a five star rating, and check us out live Monday through Friday, right here from 8 to 10 a.m. Eastern on the DraftKings Network, Samsung TV Plus, and Roku. You can also check us out every day, the best of Gojo and Golik, wherever you get VSIN from noon to 1 p.m. Eastern. Got a banger coming up here today. Claudia, what's on the docket? Yeah, stacked Monday show for you guys, of course. We're going to talk a lot of hoops. So the madness of March, UConn domination, and women's star power. Draft time capsule. Really excited for this one, guys. Locking in takes for the 2024 NFL draft. And all weekend teams, which weekend warriors deserve kudos. And we're going to get to hoops, like I mentioned. But I first just have to say it really warms my heart the day after Easter to see you guys together on the show this fine Monday, guys. No, it'd be really heartwarming if I didn't have to rip my dad for his tech setup here. He's got us using what? one microphone. I he don't couldn't, have, I he don't couldn't have shell out the extra money to buy two microphones. You've been making money in this industry for like three decades, Listen. and you can't come in here. Now i got to share a hand-me-down microphone with you. What's hey, going on number here? Number one, my equipment works just fine. Uh -huh. It's been working just fine. Okay. It, I've had no issues here. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, you've come here merged your equipment with my equipment, and all of a sudden it doesn't work. So who's at fault here? Mine worked fine, you were added to the equation, and then it didn't work. So that's on you, my friend, not on me. You screw I have a wonderful setup here that you invaded and you broke. Anyone going to trust my father on the tech, st tech side of things? Absolutely not. So, Claudia, I hope this was the heartwarming vision you had yeah. of Easter in the Golick family household because outside of us, it, uh, the only thing I'll say is Easter yesterday, a lot of people, I don't know how they approach the Easter holiday. It's not one with, I think, a rich food background in terms of here are specific things you eat on Easter. So we just took it upon ourselves to basically cater from Portillo's. Yeah, we did. So I am stuffed full of so much Italian beef mm. and so much chocolate cake, it physically hurts to move right now. So that was Easter for us. The first thing I'd like to know is what, what Jesse and their family had as food. What oh, kind my of, God, What kind yeah. of caviar and stone crabs they may have had on this. And, and yes, uh, Claudia, we have the whole family here, Jake and Jenny, who live out in Boston, by you there, and their son Jackson have made their way out here. Mike has made his way in from California. Also, Sydney and Ben live out here. So we have the whole family together, and two, including the two grandkids, the two cousins, met for the first time, a 21-month-old yeah. and a four-month-old. So we're going to work on that part of it uh, as, they, as they grow a little bit older. But it's... Uh, it's been very nice. But yes, we catered Portillo's, which really brought back in our starch madness of why the yeah. Portillo's milk uh, cake uh, chocolate shake. cake shake was not on this list because it would have won. I had one again yesterday. It's the greatest shake known to mankind. Yeah, we will get to plenty of yeah. Starch Madness wrap-up as well today. We got a lot moving forward in that tournament, our quest to find the best fast food item in the country. But while we were ingesting all this Portillo's yesterday and Easter baskets, as a 34-year-old man still put together by my mother, God bless her and keep her, still gave each and every one of her children and grandchildren Easter baskets because the standard is the standard. Yeah. Uh, Dad, we had some pretty good basketball to watch over this entire weekend, and we'll get to a lot of the women's tournament reaction with Chinea Gwumake, hopefully going to join us here as part of the great ESPN coverage, her, Andrea Carter, and L. Duncan, that got a ton of love yeah. over the weekend here, but I did not think in all of the permutations of how this tournament could have gone that we would have walked in here the Monday after Easter, getting ready to march through the final leg of the Elite Eight in the women's tournament and into the final four on the men's side that NC State would be the biggest story in the college basketball world. But here we are with now both the NC State men's and women's team moving on to the Final Four. The first time in school history that that's happened for these two, for this uh, school in particular. Depending on where you look, I saw ESPN say this is the 11th time that this had happened overall. I saw some places say 14th, but... The bottom line is the Wolfpack touching rarefied air dad, getting both teams through in this tournament. And on the men's side, they have done it on the backs of one of the tournament darlings oh. now in star big man DJ Burns, who we identified going through the ACC tournament, said we got a hoss on our hands. And dad, this man, all he has done has improved his draft stock potentially for pro basketball, but at the very worst, me and many others on the football side praying to God this young man wants to put his hand in the dirt and maybe yeah. explore left tackle in the future. Yeah, you, you wonder how that's going to go. We've certainly seen basketball players move on to the NFL and become Hall of Fame players So because of their athletic ability. 
Not sure what DJ Burns' future is going to be, but he's fun to watch. Didn't score much in the got in early foul trouble. Didn't score much yep. early. Was mon- big monster time play in the second half as they took out number four Duke. Uh, quickly, on the, as we'll get into on the women's side, North Carolina State beat number one Texas. So another number one is knocked out on the women's side as they finish up uh, getting to the Final Four with a couple of doozies tonight that we'll get to. But yeah, DJ Burns has become something of a fascina- fascination, right? And, and this is the team who that monster game in the tournament against, I believe it was Virginia, with a last-second shot. I mean, yeah. you want to talk about one shot getting you on the road to where they are now, or at least giving you a chance, and they have taken advantage of that chance from a a, a big-time shot in the tournament against, a, 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 as I said, a Virginia opponent to where they are now in the Final Four. And, and just having someone that's done it the way that they have, you mentioned the five and five days for the ACC tournament, but winning on the back, we talked about this tournament sort of a big man renaissance, and styles make fights in all these, right? Zach Eady and Purdue exercise a lot of demons getting back to the Final Four after the embarrassment they suffered for a prior year, but Zach Eady doing that as a seven foot four traditional back to the back post up guy. Donovan Klingon with UConn that we'll talk about, who looked like a buzzsaw. Oh my gosh. He's a little yeah. bit more of the modern big, running the floor a right. little bit, can do a lot more things movement wise that we see of the guys here now. And then there's Zach Eady, who when you even talk, when you even look and talk to Kevin Keats, their coach, he says, "I haven't thrown the ball down into the post like this in years." He's such a unicorn of a player because you see 6'9", 275, and his build. It's not traditional. Traditionally what we see in college basketball anymore, but then you see the feet, how he is on the block, being able to wiggle and swim past guys all in the low post. It's a really compelling and visually appealing style of basketball because you wouldn't expect the big man to be this nimble and he goes out there and he shatters stereotypes. I love every time they go to the to the halftime report and Barkley talks about him. Yeah. Because this, is, this is right up Barkley's alley. He wants to call him son so yeah. bad. A, a big guy who doesn't look, doesn't, you know, have that appearance of this unbelievable athlete but moves amazingly well. His feet and his little turnaround uh, hook, the left-handed oh. hook, is just He incredible. got a spin move like Dwight Freedy. Yeah, and now the matchup with he and Zach Eady. I, can, I am so waiting for this one, the two big men. It's the battle of the two big men, so let me ask you this then. The line, Purdue laying nine, nine-point favorites. I have to say, and by the way, one of my brackets, I am in first place. It is a, a bracket with, I think it's like 50 other guys in some fantasy league that I usually do. So I am in first place for the bracket. Obviously, uh, Kentucky didn't win at all, but I've done pretty well up until then. The other team that's made me a ton of money, though, is NC State because they keep getting disrespected, yeah. catching the points. I'm playing them money line. I'm playing them with the points. Now you're getting nine. Are you guys tempted to take the nine with Burns and that crew? I, I am just because you also saw in this game uh, last night the other DJ that gets involved uh, in all this one for them too. Mm-hmm. Ooh, why am I? Uh, anyway. The rest of the team that gets involved in this, too, is very good for NC State. What they've managed to do so far, I think they could pull this off. I think it's going to be an interesting and compelling matchup on the inside because Edie is just game-altering in his presence around the rim. We've seen what he's done. DJ Horn was the name that escaped me in the t- candy-fueled hangover that I'm on right now. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, Zach Edie's bent a lot of wor- the world to his nature in the yeah. post. I think Purdue is ultimately in line to win this because if you're going to go big on big like that in the post, even with how fleet of foot uh, DJ's looked so far this tournament, Zach Eady, it's just a different animal in closing than he's dealt with before so, so far. So this is my fear in this game, right? Yeah. We got a matchup of, of Eady and of Burns, 6'9 against 7'4, two of the big names we've been talking about. My fear is foul trouble. Yeah, that is my fear. It happened with DJ Burns, as I said in the game against Duke. wasn't you know very you know involved in the first half. Really was in the second half. But that's the thing of one of these guys getting too early fouls and then having to go to the bench when you yep. want that matchup. So you know it, it's the fine line of you don't want the rest to swallow the whistle, but you don't want them being ticky tack, right? You always as players, you're always. I don't care what sport, what and and even dirt in the sport within the sport. Mike, as an old lineman, what do you see early in the game you can get away with, you know, as, as far as holding or doing something? And as a defensive lineman or a defensive player, you find out what you can get away with here. If you're a DB, how much can you chuck down the field, have your hands on a guy? Are they letting it go a little bit? It's the same way in basketball. You find out in the first two, three, five minutes how they're calling the game. And, man, if they're calling the game tight and you get that early foul on, on one of these guys – 
that because there's such anticipation for it, get ready to start reading the tweets. You know, the yeah. people are going to be blasting the officials to stay out of this game. Let them play, Claudia. Yeah. Let them yeah. play. Well, Coach, I was going to ask you about that because I felt I heard everybody else talking about the fact that Edie was getting all the calls, nothing called against him on defense. Did you feel that as well, or do you think that the calls were played right? Uh, I think for the most part I agree with the way it was called. I, I get that sometimes it's going to – especially with a guy that big, it's always sort of tough to legislate what you're going to let get away and what you're going to let go in certain spots. It felt like at the end of a lot of these games, the refs were just letting them basically do whatever they want. The Duke NC State game had some of that feel to it as well. So I I'm with you. I hope they let them play in this one. It's going to be an incredibly compelling matchup there. This one, for people down in the triangle, NC State and Duke, North Carolina yeah. fans had to be hoping the entire stadium sank into the ground. But for everyone else, I'd imagine there's a lion's share of people that – if you were going to have one of those sides go on, the answer was going to be anyone but Duke for so many of those people. Dad, on the women's side, NC State's women's team, a much more unlikely, I shouldn't say much more unlikely, but both of these teams, you know, NC State and the men's side, an 11 seed, the NC State women's team just became the first team to make the Final Four after being unranked in the AP poll since Washington did it in 2015, 2016. So they wound up as a three seed and definitely battled their way into more. But this was not what was expected of this team going into the season at all to get things started. Isaiah James is the most outstanding player of the tournament for this region right now and helped lead this team back to the point now where they're making the Final Four for the first time in 26 years. Yeah. Yeah, knocking out a number one seed led by that freshman All-American and Madison Booker, one of the top players. We've seen three star freshmen. Booker and her team in Texas is out. Uh, Hannah Hidalgo from Notre Dame, her team is out. But Juju Watkins' team is still in as they play tonight. We've got a couple of absolute, to use your tune, bangers tonight. Yes. In Iowa and LSU and USC and UConn. UConn, another team that has may get two teams into the Final Four as they are on the men's side, could possibly do it on the women's side, which is something we've been pretty used to. It's a little more ho-hum yeah. for yeah. them yeah. because as you look, the only teams to win on uh, the championship on both the men's and women's side ever have been UConn twice in 2004 and 2014. So this is something that they're a little bit more used to out there. Paige Beckers and Juju Watkins going to be yeah, a bona fide matchup. stud matchup. Paige Beckers somehow has now become one of the most underrated players in women's college wow. basketball because of the injury through the course of the season. But yeah, that's because all eyes are going to be trained on this LSU and Iowa matchup. Well, they are. And also, I think she became underrated, whether that's the word or not. I mean, she was all everything her freshman year, right? And then she had the injuries and coming back from them. And while she was injured, we had these other women becoming, you know, household names, right? Oh, yeah. Like Caitlin I Clark, like Angel Reese, and then the freshmen who have come onto the scene that we've gotten to know this year. Paige Beckers kind of went into the background, uh, but her play now has put her right in the forefront, and Gino Ariemer, her coach, is trying to remind everybody, you know what, no, 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 I got the best player in the I guess country. it's just amazing to me that we have to coax people into talking about the dominant UConn mm. women's basketball player. That's never been a problem in my entire lifetime, and so now, to see us here, you're right, is a testament to how the sport's grown in other areas. It's what UConn has helped the sport become, UConn. Tennessee, these programs that now everyone else stands on the shoulders of here. Look forward to a matchup that I, I, I'd have to imagine, Dad, LSU-Iowa is going to break every meaningful television record when it comes to the women's game and likely any sporting event that we're going to see for the majority of the season. The rematch of the title game last year between Iowa and LSU where we had the famed Angel Reese wing, uh, ring finger wagging in front of Caitlin Clark mim mimicking her celebration and just a matchup of two very different styles and teams with the defending champion LSU Tigers walking into this one. Going to try and once again, I I'm sure in their minds, blow up the big story that everyone else has been talking about. It's been Caitlin Clark mania all year for the rest of college basketball, and LSU would like to, I'm sure, remind people, hey, we're the defending champions for a reason. Come get some of this. The one line that makes me feel really old was uh, Angel Reese oh, when boy. she was asked about the way Larry Bird and Magic Johnson were always linked after playing each other in the national championship game like Angel Reese and Caitlin Clark. And Reese's response, people do compare that matchup all the time. But I've never seen that matchup, so I'm not totally familiar with it. Listen, I get it because she's a kid, yeah. but man, does that again just put a stamp on how friggin' old I am. Yeah, no, it should, <laughs> it should absolutely make you feel ancient there, but it's, a, it's an apt comparison in a lot of ways, and I think we, we've seen both of these teams imbue a lot of interesting feelings, and yeah. it, it got really 
interesting is a bad word. Ugly is probably yeah, the right yeah. word the other day because think about the backdrop that we had going into this game, especially for LSU. There have been all this wonder and intrigue around the Washington Post article about Kim Mulkey that was supposed to come out. Kim Mulkey comes out and mounts this offensive for a Washington Post piece that ends up basically just being a profile, That's a profile exactly right. that was pretty long. If, yep. if you're familiar with Kim Mulkey, you might not have learned a ton new over the course of this article, and that was quickly quickly left in the rear view mirror think the guy looking at the different girl meme when all of a sudden the LA Times decided to post an article in the lead up to the UCLA LSU game there with uh, lines in this article that have now since been removed by the way the LA Times went through I checked this morning and the editor's note said the original version of this commentary did not meet Times editorial standards it's been edited to remove language that was inappropriate and offensive we apologize to LSU basketball and our readers like that's the point that we got to when you had the original article say quote and this is Ben Bolch's article in the LA Times this isn't just a basketball game it's a reckoning Picking sides goes well beyond school allegiance. Do you prefer America's sweethearts or its dirty debutantes? Milk and cookies or Louisiana hot sauce? Like, Dad, all of this that Haley Van Lith, the point guard for the LSU Tigers, a young, and for this pace, I think notably, uh, notably white young woman, came out and said, the way they're talking about my teammates is cloaked in racism here. There are absolutely undertones to this that scream of a racial bias in the way it talks about LSU and the largely black women on its team versus UCLA. It's not to say UCLA doesn't have young black women on their team as well, but the characterization of these two teams because of how one side's perceived because they are themselves, they speak loudly of themselves, they're very self-confident, all these different things that, as Haley points out, is a double standard for the way yeah. it's talked about for a lot of the rest of, in general, the women in college basketball. But even that, you could say, Dad, it's also cloaked in some of the sexism that we don't apply to men who are also loudly themselves in certain positions and yet somehow only come down on women for. It is amazing how we are all waiting for the Washington Post you know, uh, uh, article to come out, and it was this one in the L.A. Times. Oh, you my know, God. That, the Post, it was like... Kim Mulkey was like, my lawyers are going to read it, and they're ready to sue if they got to sue. And and that was the Times article. And listen, you can have your opinion out there on what you think the two teams are like, right? You know, and and there are he wouldn't be the first to say this is like because everyone pointing to the way Angel Reese reacted with the pointing to the ring and the you know washing of the face and all that type of thing. Which again. Man, I don't care. It's competitive nature. And these two players even basically said the same thing. Which it, is hilarious that yeah. they even had to come out yeah, and say, yeah. yes, we don't hate each other. We're just competitors. This thing that we lionize in so much of sports, but for some reason here, we've decided to make into the biggest issue known to mankind. And, and uh, it, it had a little bit of, you know, you know, tentacle to it as UCLA's coach Corey Close had to issue an apology because she said, or said said that the the post or the she reposted she it without re reading reposted it. it without reading it and apologized for it and said after she read it she's like oh my god you know this was wrong and it came out and apologized for it so yeah this this article really kind of kind of took over we are getting a great matchup tonight and let's just look at it as a great basketball matchup I mean that that's what it is I mean to have all the undertones out there and you know a paper because papers usually stand by their writers and stand by their articles. And for them to come out and change and, and take away some of the lines and the headlines and stuff uh, really kind of says what, you know, they what? had some rethinking to do. Well, I want to know what editor let that go through to begin with. Those same people that just decided to retract it were also the ones that allowed them to post it to begin with. And so, yeah, for all the weird characterization and subtle racism, in this case, I don't even know if it's super subtle to begin with, I I'm I am hoping it can give way to a game that we can just enjoy because yeah. we've got incredibly compelling characters on and off the court in this game. People who are giving of themselves, who aren't afraid to be themselves on this big stage, and now have it. What could be one of the biggest matchups in modern women's college yep. basketball. I, I think we're all going to search around for comps, and hopefully when we talk to Janae Agumake here in a little bit, she'll be able to give us former number one overall pick in the right. WNBA draft, former Stanford basketball great. Where does this matchup rank all time in terms of what we've seen in the women's tournament?
All right, welcome back to Gojo and Golik. Mike Golik Jr., Mike Golik Sr. And as we carry on now, we're looking ahead to more great Elite Eight matchups tonight in the women's tournament. But as that marches forward as well, we're very excited to talk to a good old friend of ours, yes. someone who's now become the voice and face of this yep. tournament. When you've tuned in to watch women basketball in the last couple of weekends, you have turned into some incredible coverage from ESPN's L. Duncan, Andrea Carter, and of course, our very good friend, the former co-host of Cheney and Golik Jr., Chinea Gwumake joining us right now here, the former number one overall pick, proud Stanford Cardinal. Chinea, what's up? We're back. I missed you all. Oh my gosh, good times. Some of my happiest times have been hanging with you all. I mean, literally, your family to me. And so, yes, it's been an amazing. It is. Yeah, yeah. I, I was gonna say too. I, I love the fact of how much fun you guys have. You know, you, you, you. It's a sport. You guys break it down great. That that desk you guys have of the three of you has been fantastic. You're doing a great job. Thank you so much. My goodness, Al is phenomenal. Andrea, just a huge rising star, and so we've been having fun. We didn't realize it was gonna be like a kickback. I mean, games are literally from sunrise to sundown, and we just were following them, uh, learning, loving the game, and then just kick. I mean, you guys know it's how the jokes are going to be crazy, the dad jokes. <laughs> oh, yeah. All, all day, every day. And, and thankfully, you've had plenty of that mixed in with a ton of great basketball that we do want to get into with you. To Chanae here, before we get to the matchup coming up tonight that everyone's looking forward to, you know, Caitlin Clark and LSU, Angel or Angel Reese and LSU, Caitlin Clark and Iowa here, we've already got some of the final four tickets punched here. And I think the women's basketball world right now begins and ends with South Carolina. So as you look at Dawn Staley's squad right now and their road through the tournament, have we seen any cracks in the armor? Is what do you need to do to be able to take down what's been the best team in the women's game from start to finish this year? I've been saying that the biggest threat to South Carolina is br 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 South Carolina because they had one, I guess you <laughs> could say, glaring weakness last year, and that was their perimeter shooting. And now they are number one in Division One in three-point shooting, largely because of the improvement of players like Raven Johnson and Bree Hall, but also getting transfer in to Hina Pow Pow, who's like third in three-point shooting percentage. And so they eliminated that weakness. On top of it, they have reloaded. They have post players that are great. They can withstand games that they do not shoot the ball great. And that's exactly what we saw versus Oregon State. They did not shoot the ball well. And what happened? Oh, we're just going to go to work in the paint. They had a plus 30 paint point differential. They had 44 points in the paint. What do they not have? They have perimeter scoring. They have points in the paint. They can beat you with defense. I think Ashlyn Watkins, which we're joking and calling her Ashlyn Swatkins, uh, her opponents were 0 for 8 against her, including like game saving, uh, saving blocks from last round to this round. And they're coached by Don Staley, the legend. So their biggest threat is literally themselves these days. Yeah, and their, their, their threat on the court is going to be North Carolina State pulling off that win over number one Texas. Uh, a, a big win for them. Uh, I, I, we, we can get into that game, you know, it's, it's, since it's next week. Let's jump into the games uh, that we have tonight. And let's start with USC and UConn. Juju Watkins, Paige Beckers. As Mike said earlier, she, she kind of fell off the map a little bit after getting hurt her freshman year. Coming back from that, other names and teams have really jumped out. But Gino Auriemma said, listen, I think I have the best player in the country now against one of the great young players in Juju Watkins. So how do you see this one? That was a spicy take by Gino. That was a spicy take. Yeah. And I like that because it's like, I'm her coach, so I'm allowed to say this. But that's interesting because we all know Caitlin Clark is the greatest scorer the college game men's or women's has ever seen. But what Paige is doing from an efficiency standpoint, also from a need standpoint, I think she, through the first two rounds, she was the only player in the last 25 years to have a combined 60 points, 20 rebounds, and assists. What Paige is doing is truly special. And I love that she just is natural with her bag. A lot of times when we talk about Caitlin Clark, it's a lot of the threes, it's the lip. But Paige, she's got a little bit more like, you know, that sauce to her game where she's playing in that pick and roll. She's fortunate to play with Aaliyah Edwards, who has just declared for the WNBA draft for after the tournament. And so for me, I look at Paige and I'm like, here in Gino, and Don Staley was like, hey, I mean, she is the best player. It was spicy considering that we're witnessing Caitlin right now. 
But in some ways, we can see how Paige is just as complete, baby, not just leaning more so on the threes than Caitlyn is. So I was like, oh, this is spicy, and we got a great matchup with, like, you have these stellar veterans, and then they're going up against Juju Watkins, who was just, y'all know I'm in L.A. Oh, yeah, Junior as well, right? So, like, Juju, a stellar <laughs> freshman. It's cool because you see with Paige and Caitlyn and even Angel, there's, like, a passing of the baton to this amazing freshman class. And we know you know about the freshman class because you're the biggest fan of Mrs. Hidalgo. Uh-huh. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Make her defensive player of the year, you cowards. I know you can all hear me out there right now. <laughs> she deserves it. Uh, Janae, before we get on to the big marquee match of the weekend, I did have to bring up what we saw go on in Portland on the court, but off the court before the Texas and NC State game the other day as the news came out about the differing length three-point lines that both teams agreed to play through and did. But how disappointing is this of a headline to see coming out in the midst of everything great that's been going on for the women's game right now? It's really disappointing considering that like a lot of the reaction from the coaches to the players are like, only in women's basketball, like we should, there should be a, a greater attention to detail, especially considering the magnitude of this tournament. I mean, all eyes are on us and it's a beautiful thing. And to see that happen. And even yesterday I said, like, that's a really tough decision to decide to play. And I respect the players for making that decision because imagine that you're coming, you're prepared. You spent two days ready for the elite eight. You're ready to advance to the final four. You have the game plans. You're warming up. The coaches have got you there. The, the, Fans are there, like the moment is ready, and then you notice a few minutes before tip, there's a discrepancy on the lines. That's a really tough decision to say, like, let's push through because they understand that the circumstances would be complicated if they didn't play that game. And that's why I commended the ladies. But nonetheless, there should never be a situation where you look at a court and it has that type of difference. Like, that is not the standard that we should be preaching when it comes to what the women's game's trajectory has been for so long. So it was extremely disappointing and, you know, I, I think it was a very tough decision. I think a lot of it came down to we're already here. The moment is here. Why would like to rev ourselves up to have another moment like this would be very complicated. But still, it's like even as we're progressing, it just reminded us that as a game, we still have a ways to go to demand the things that we deserve. Obviously difficult for some people to still read a tape measure, which blows my mind. And that was uh, I, I'm with <laughs> you. Credit to the women for playing through that one. All right. Today, I mean. LSU, Iowa, go. <laughs> <laughs> I got you. I got you. So this one is like, I, I didn't even know that. When we saw the bracket, we're like, oh my gosh. And then you get nervous because it's March Madness. And you're like, oh, you never know anything can happen. And we got exactly what the basketball gods of Spalding and Wilson have just gifted us with. The matchup <laughs> of the ages. Let's start with Iowa. Caitlin has a lot on her shoulders. She accounted for 69% of Iowa's offense last game. 29 points. 15 assists. And the reason why that number is so high is because her teammates did not let her down. She was able to distribute and they knocked down shots. They will need that again. They just played their most complete game of the tournament so far and of probably like the last 10 games. So they're walking in confident. But the real reality is I was a number one seed, but it, honestly, it's like they're the underdogs because LSU is the defending champs and they are a juggernaut. They have the advantage on boards. I've been joking and saying that the it's the NCAA tournament and the two A's stand for, stand for Angel Reese and Anissa Morrow. They are walking double-doubles. Angel averages 19 and 13. Anissa averages 16 and 10. And they can even play aggressive because Angel fouled out of the last game. And Anissa said, oh, no problem. I got it. Like, they have a luxury on the boards. They have a luxury also just being able to be dynamic. They have the size advantage. But still, I mean, we're, it's like, they're going up against the greatest score men's or women's that we've ever seen. Someone that has just always met the moment. I think like our heads are going to explode watching this game in studio. It's going to be so much fun. <laughs> I, it, it, is, it is that kind of box office that we're all expecting here. But box office is what they expect when they yep. watch women's basketball. And certainly anytime you check out Shanae Agwumake, whether it is on the coverage of the NCAA Women's Tournament right now on NBA Today, you can check her out on the Shanae Show on YouTube and everywhere as well over at Players TV. Shanae, thank you so much. We love you, buddy. Congrats and good luck on the rest of the coverage. Appreciate you, Junior. And you're still a zaddy over there. Yeah. Love y'all. Oh, God. <laughs> of course. Thank you. Of course, we couldn't get out of here without one more zaddy comment thrown onto the pile here. Always loved her. God, always I can say, her. it's always, it's always your comment. closest friends, huh? <laughs> <laughs>
men's hoops is headed to Glendale for the Final Four. We talked about it already, but NC State is the Cinderella story here. Taking down Duke, first Final Four appearance since 1983. Purdue onto the third Final Four. Zach Eady dropped 40 in the win. We'll probably see a little bit more of that. And then how about Bama rallies over Clemson to reach their first Final Four? And lastly... UConn. I mean, we knew they were going to be good, but a 30-0 and run is absolutely bonkers. Now, I did warn you, if there was a time to hop on UConn, it was at the beginning of the season, before this tournament, if anything, if you wanted plus money. But now you got to risk 195 to win 100. The value's gone on UConn. Purdue second in the odds at plus 205. And then a decent jump with Crimson Tide and NC State at 16-1. to and I feel like it's silly to even ask, but can you push yourself to bet on anybody but UConn at this point? Oh, I, no. As someone who picked them in our bracket challenge they here did. on Gojo and Golik, we had the draft uh, challenge over on DraftKings Sportsbook uh, where people could win some great bonus bet money there. I'm riding UConn all the way to yeah. the finish to try and figure out who's going to finish better between me and you after you talked all that crap before. I did. I have Purdue winning it all, but I mean, I was under a thought. I was in like 899th place out of, again, 43,000 yeah. going into the weekend. I am now in 16,115th place. You are ahead of me. I'm in like 9,600th place, basically, so I did. after Duke loss yesterday. I talked a lot of smack, and I just got smacked down. Uh, in these games, so I, I just have to hope Purdue wins it all. We're, I'm sitting there. We had the whole family here, as I talked about at the top of the show early on. Ben and I, my son-in-law Ben, were the only two in the room at the point where we're watching the UConn game, and we're watching them, and it's tied 23-all, right? We're like, okay, you know, it's a pretty good game. Tied 23-all, cool. And then UConn went on a 30 to nothing. We were sitting there just amazed. They were hitting their shots Illinois couldn't hit a shot. I mean, could not hit a shot at all. Uh, UConn was getting steals, making plays, slam dunks, three-pointers. A 23-23 to 53-23, and not even in the blink of the eye. It was like a slow blade going into your rib cage uh, the way they were doing it. That was an amazing run. They just, they're just, they're just going to be so tough to beat. Yeah, it's it's. Right now, a Herculean task. Would I pick yeah. anyone to beat them? No, absolutely not. We've said it for a couple of rounds now. This UConn team looks like a buzzsaw. Danny Hurley's outfit has had everything you could ask for in terms of, hey, being able to knock down shots in rapid right. succession, constant movement on offense, an NBA caliber player in Donovan Klingon in the middle of all this who represents a little bit more of the modern seven-footer than maybe a guy like Zach Eady, who's a little <laughs> bit more plodding, a little bit more down on the block in terms of playing style. And so, no, I think UConn is very poised to be the first repeat champion since 06, 07. Florida, the one thing that you hear people talk about that could potentially undermine this is if Alabama was able to get hot from three again, right. made 16 threes in their win over Clemson in the Elite Eight matchup, and is a team that if they can get going from beyond the arc, maybe you put some added stress on UConn in a way that's able to crack that, but that's not something I'd be willing to bet on at this point, the way that UConn has looked. Dad, they have led out of 80 possible tournament minutes so far this, uh, this run. They have led for 76 minutes and three seconds of the tournament not just led, by double digits yeah, yeah. they have led in that time period. So it has been an unprecedented level of dominance from the Huskies so far for the men. So the Final Four team, especially for the casual fan, Alabama kind of that team everybody's like wondering about. Sure. You know, because UConn's UConn. Uh, obviously, Purdue was Zach Eady. And now the North Carolina State story, the double-digit seed coming into the Final Four and D.J. Burns becoming this larger than life, though he doesn't need to become larger than life, yes. you know, a personality. But Alabama, it's just like people don't know a lot about him. But you just said it. If Alabama's going to win this game, they have got to be unbelievably sharp at the three-point line. I mean, yeah. that's, that's where they love to live. And they were hot in the last game. They get the, the win over Clemson doing that. Uh, so they're going to they're gonna have to be so on that part of their game. When you're facing a team as good as UConn, you, if both teams play their best, UConn's going to win. 
You can't make the mistakes. You have to hope for UConn to, and that's a difficult task. Task, but you can't make the mistakes, or are you just giving UConn more more air in the ball. No, exactly. I think the one because everyone else we we've kind of known something about, right? Zach Eady is going to be a guy that likely sweeps a ton of the Player of the Year awards at the end of the season. We've talked about DJ Burns and what's about, you know gone on with him really since the AT, ACC tournament as his star power has grown. UConn is UConn, the defending national champions, and Alabama. I'd say the closest we got was Grant Nelson in the prior round when he decided to really go off for the first time all tournament scoring into double digits talked about him as one of the best transfers in men's college basketball from North Dakota State he's got the weird mustache he sort of came back down to earth in this last one only eight points in this last outing Mark uh, Mark uh, Sears yeah. who had been Alabama's leading scorer for the majority of the season the leading scorer again here but that's really been the only story that I think would have grabbed people in from the outside the casual viewer during this March Madness run yeah yeah that, that that's it so I mean Sears is gonna have to be out of his mind right he's gonna have to hit he, in there there win over Clemson. He took 18, uh, I'm sorry, 14 threes. 14 of his 18 shots were from three-point land. And he would hit 50% of it, hit seven of them. So he's going to need to hit. Other guys are going to have to step up and hit. Or if, if UConn's going to win, the one thing we'll be able to look at is if they do win, no matter what happens on the other side, we're going to get another Good big man matchup, right? Klingon on either Zach Eady or DJ Burns. So we could, we'll get it on the right side of the bracket now with Burns and Eady, and we could get it in the finals as well when you, if UConn wins. And we've talked about one of the big reasons why it's felt like women's college basketball has been so much easier to latch onto is because you've got compelling characters. Right. You've got these people. While we've seen Angel Reese and LSU have to deal with some negative headlines, as we talked about, some what uh, felt like racist language right. in an LA Times article discussing them because of the way they carry themselves, I think it's also made them really compelling to watch because you know, hey, when I tune in, Angel Reese is going to wear her heart on her sleeve. Yep. You're going to see her flirt with that line every time the same way. Hey, when we talk about now NC State and what's going on with DJ Burns, part of it's because this guy plays the game. You saw him in between timeouts, video of him dancing around to whatever music was playing in the stadium there, chirping back and forth with Duke fans, telling them that you're going home, we're ending your season, doing all that stuff. Like He's a guy that feels like a character. He's a guy that feels like he's got some personality to him that is even for everyone to latch on to. Going up against Zach Eady, that's the polar opposite. This guy that has been, and we've said, talking about the different forces at play in men's college basketball, why maybe the popularity has waned a little bit. We referenced the one and done. Zach Eady's been here. Yep. He's been around for a long time. The problem is, he's just not a guy that's as comfortable giving himself out in public. He's not as big of a personality. He's just a big body who plays great basketball to the tune of 40 points and 16 yeah. rebounds in this last game. The first player to have 40 and 15 in an NCAA tournament game since 1990, according to ESPN stats and info. And so, we don't feel like we know as much about a guy, even though we We've had him here for a lot longer. And there's something, I think, added to it, maybe because we're large human beings. Sure. When it's big men matching up, right? You have great players, but when it's big men matching up, Burns and Edie, when they're matching up, when they get to the finals, if it's Klingon, the 7-2 the, the kid from UConn, big men matching up. They're, they're, to me, there's something about that uh, that I'm looking forward to. As I said about that, I, you know, you pray there's no foul trouble involved. Even tonight, Angel Reese... You yeah, know, has gotten herself into some foul trouble before. That would be another one because this this game is going to set records, like it did last year in the finals when LSU beat Iowa, setting records as far as uh, audience. It's going to tonight, and the worst thing in the world you're going to want to see is Angel Reese have to go to the sideline because of foul trouble. No, completely with you, and I do think there's something to what you mentioned in the post up, Dad, because we've talked about so much of this through the lens of the NBA, where the true back-to-the-basket post-up yeah. on the block has become one of the least yep. efficient shots in the sport. And you look at women's college basketball, much bigger post presence with some of the players we've talked about. Camila Cardosa oh, on yeah. South Carolina has been phenomenal. Um, Beers from Oregon State that just lost in the mm -hmm. last round. Another compelling player there. On the men's side, now getting that, seeing a guy like DJ Burns go down there with a defined bag of post moves, seeing Zach Eady work down, it feels like a relic of a bygone era. It's something we don't get to see as much of anymore. And to not only see it, but see it done well now is kind of a cool throwback in the midst of the tournament. And I think I think if you're North Carolina State, you want to do you want to go to DJ Burns, but you want to see if, in fact, he can get Eady into foul trouble, right? You want to go to him, do those spin moves, try and get a little body contact, and see if you can do it. They would love it. North Carolina State would love to see Edie sitting on the bench. 
But we wouldn't like that. No. We want to see them all on the court. No, none of us would like that. It's certainly, I think, going to be an easy decision whether we've seen to double team or not to double team right. DJ Burns. When you got Zach Eady, that decision becomes pretty easy to let those two go down in the block and let them fight. talked a lot about hoops, but other sports did happen as well. Curious, though, if maybe it is just all basketball. I need your all-weekend team, Gojo. What do you got? Yeah, no, hard to look away from hoops for the weekend, but we got a few other entrants into the party from the world of sports over the weekend that we think can crack the squad. So we'll go honorable mention, second team, and first team all weekend. And Honorable mention will be the only spot where I dip into basketball here because we've talked a couple of times now and referenced the LA Times article that has since had portions of it redacted, referencing and characterizing Angel Reese and this LSU women's basketball team in a way that I thought bordered on racially insensitive at the very least. But they have once again found a way to just turn around, weaponize and use against people. Angel Reese on her Instagram account after the game at what looked like a team meal had on the table, what the uh, author had characterized it as, as milk and cookies versus Louisiana hot sauce, describing UCLA versus LSU. And so, of course, Angel Reese went to Instagram and put milk and cookies on one side versus a bunch of Louisiana ah. hot sauce on the other side. And uh, Dad, that's one of the things I've appreciated about this LSU team. Certainly, what's going on with Kim Mulkey, the discussion around her has always been separate. This team hasn't let anything really bother them over the course of this year. You had the headlines about Angel Reese mysteriously not being on the court for a few games early this season and they just took everything in stride kept building and now they're right back on the doorstep of getting back to the championship they won last year all while doing it their own way whether it's angel reese whether it's flage johnson there are big personalities and young women that have given a lot of themselves to the sport of college basketball. i'm a big fan of those that lean into things yeah. right and angel reese is leaning into it so i absolutely love that it's it's plus you take what's out there 
to whatever put your, your chip on your shoulder, whether yes. it's an individual person or a team that's going to try and motivate you a little bit. It's so true. And usually we make great teams work for that chip. Alabama yeah. and Georgia have having to basically yeah. fake chips on their shoulder for years. And we've got an LSU team led by one of the better coaches in women's college yeah. basketball, certainly some of the best players. And we're just giving them free chips. They find a way. They all The great ones find a way to, to make you go, wait, wait, what? You're right. Alabama, Georgia, Tom Brady are all ones that were like, yeah. wait a minute, what? And even Kansas City this year, a little bit of man, we're the underdogs. Nobody believes in us, you know. Like back to back, you know, Super Bowls and all that. So, I, hey, kudos to LSU for doing that. So, Angel Reese, getting your honorable mention. My honorable mention is going to the world of baseball. Congrats early on to the undefeateds that are left. We only have four left: the Yankees four and zero, Pittsburgh four and zero, Detroit three and zero. In Milwaukee, 3-0. And I love the Juan Soto quote from the Yankees. Yeah, you latched on to this. I, I, I did. I, I love it. They're 4-0, and he said, it's the start I wanted. Really? It's, it's the start you wanted. Great. Does, wouldn't anybody want that start? Doesn't anybody want to be undefeated? I mean... Did you put him on the all-weekend team to rip him? No, I put all the teams that are undefeated. It sounds like you and just did this to rip Juan Soto. No, no, no. I congratulate the undefeated, which includes the Yankees, but then an ancillary part of it was I scratched my head a little bit at that comment like, wouldn't everybody want that? Wouldn't we all want well, to yeah, start Well, yeah, and like that? he's everybody. Okay. And he got, and the difference is okay. he got the start. Oh, no, he did. He did. Congrats to him. <laughs> rip, Whatever. Put him on the all-weekend team just to rip no, the guy. No, I put guy. all the teams you just so I could use that quote and say that. Let me let me show you how you're supposed to award all-weekend ah, honors. My okay. second team all-weekend pick goes to Notre Dame All-World lacrosse goalie Liam Entman. Oh, my god. The number one play on SportsCenter's top 10 for an incredible diving save in the midst of a 14-12 to 12 win over number three-ranked Syracuse on the men's side. Notre Dame currently holding down the one spot, so you had a top five matchup in South Bend that Notre Dame had led and almost doubled up Syracuse for the majority of that game. But late in that game, Syracuse now has the game down to, I believe, a two or three goal margin with about four minutes left. Notre Dame goes a man down on this, and it looks like Syracuse is going to have an easy one on the doorstep to cut this thing to two goals. And Liam dives back across the net, just throws a stick out, and manages to get a little shot on this thing in what ended up being the turning point of the game as Notre Dame was able to hold on and win. Liam was the most outstanding goalie yeah. in college lacrosse last year in Notre Dame's national championship run and dad I've been hesitant but Notre Dame still looks like the best team in college lacrosse they'll have a big matchup with Duke who's been a thorn in their side for years a rematch of the title game there as well in addition to what we're getting with Caitlin Clark in Iowa versus Angel Reese so, so let's be honest I mean Notre Dame has a great team don't get me wrong but if they're going back to back it's going to be led by Entman, right I mean what he's <sighs> doing what he did in that title game last year and the fact his last name is a pastry is one of the greatest things. And that things there's no do. relation. And how does he not Amazing. have an NIL deal with Enemans? I know. I, I, it blows my mind. And we're going to get to NIL deals uh, in a bit. But that blows my mind. But they, they are looking good right now. My second team uh, is going to Friday night's game and Victor Wembenyama uh, for San Antonio. They beat the Knicks in overtime, 131-26. Wemby goes for 40-20-7 and seven <laughs> in that game. And he it was the first player, uh, first rookie player since Shaq in 93. Wow. To go for 40 and 40 plus and 20 plus. Shaq had 46 and 21 his rookie year in a game in 1993. So Wemby, the first rookie to do it since Shaq. That's some nice company to keep. And he's human. I, I believe it was it in that game in the celebration after he threw the ball in the stands, he got fined $25,000. Yeah, I saw that. Lighten his wallet a little bit there. <laughs> Tough scene on that one. But yeah. it's all, every step of the way is a learning process. I think we're all just continually amazed at how much he's already learned. Even watching him last night, yeah. the loss to Golden State, he's, still, he's now starting to look really in control of his body, his game, and it's incredible to watch. Jalen Brunson from the Knicks said, he is going to, Wemby is going to be one of the greatest players to ever play in the NBA. He put the moniker on him right now. We're going to have a conversation about him as the best player in the NBA next year. I will not be surprised when that's starting to happen, coming to a first take set near you. But for the all-weekend team today, the first team, there was no other choice, Dad. We had the UFL starting this weekend yes, we here. Did. The combined USFL and XFL kicked off their spring football weekend, and we already got it marked by what could be the premier play of the year. The San Antonio Brahmas and the DC Defenders were squaring off. And at one point, the Brahmas realized, hey, football's a simple game here. Get the ball to your best athletes in space. 
One of their best athletes happened to be offensive lineman Alex Millette, who on a trick play that featured former Giants punter Brad Wing on a fake field goal, throwing a pass, a 40-yard dart downfield to Alex Millette, who basically ran like a little wide leak, he that did. tight end leak play from the backside, caught him downfield, and then Millette, the former Marshall stud, not to be denied, with about 15 yards after the catch there, where he has to evade a defender, smells the end zone, and gets over the goal line. It's an incredible effort from the big fella to mark our first thick six of the UFL season. Uh, and that was a that was a monster play, and I knew as soon as I saw that how great uh, you would love that. Didn't we also have a 64-yard field goal? In yeah, UFL? unreal. So who is that get, kid going to be kicking yeah, for? Get camp? ready to learn NFL yeah. training camp, buddy. Uh, that's exactly right. So uh, yeah, uh, great play. As soon as I saw that kid catch the ball, I said, "Well, that's going to be on your uh, your all weekend mm. team." I'm going to stay in the big category. My first teamer is going to be DJ Burns from North Carolina State. Now I know we've talked about him on the court. But let's let's. How about this? In the last two weeks, for DJ Burns, won the ACC tournament, tripled his Instagram followers. Hell yeah! Beat Texas Tech, Oakland, Marquette, and Duke. And these are the big ones here, gang. In the last two weeks, signed deals with Adidas, Manscaped, Raising Cane. I know which one he likes you, best. And TurboTax yeah. signed four deals within the last two weeks. So a uh, good for him. And we were just talking about this. We have seen so many college athletes it's in incredible. commercials right now. It's awesome to see. But DJ Burns is absolutely piling them up right now. I, I was going to say, you can't look anywhere during March Madness without seeing national ads yep. featuring some of the most prominent names in the men's and women's game here. I know I'm the most jealous of the Raising Cane's deal here. Oh you and I both big God. fans of that. I could oh. drink Cane's th sauce through a straw yes. if you let me on a nice day. The Texas toast obviously yep. slapped. But can I say? amidst all the sea of players in these ads that you talked about. I think the funniest one is that all of these tax preparation yes, companies exactly. have finally jumped yeah. on. When What did we hear from all of the naysayers around NIL? Well, now these kids are going to have to pay taxes, and I don't know how they're going to pay taxes because we can't teach them how to pay taxes on yeah. a college campus. And so all of these tax prep companies have decided, you know what? We'll bring you into the fold and we'll lean into the bid. I think it is excellent. Chef's kiss to everybody in the I, I think it's amazing that people forget that the high majority of actual people, 18 to 21 years old, that don't play basketball have jobs and learn how to do taxes. I'm like, 34 and I, mean, I barely know how to pay taxes. I almost forgot this year. Yeah, but for the tax companies to lean into it now, this is tax season, we know it, but to have these college kids in it is very, very cool. Uh, exactly. At Gojo and Golik, if we missed any all-weekend team submissions. Coming up next, though, it's time to get our draft, combo, uh, draft time capsule ready to go for the spring.
to our two of Gojo and Golik. Now, the NFL draft is a few weeks away, but instead of just giving takes on what we think is going to happen, we're going to take this real serious, okay? This is a time capsule. Yeah. Uh, and I'm going to ask you guys a few questions. You're going to give me your answers, and then I'm going to lock them here in this box so you can't go back on anything you say. We're locking in these takes, okay? Up first, Senior, let's go to you first. The quarterback order of right. the top five, and how many quarterbacks do you think will be taken in round one? So order of the top five, and how many quarterbacks in round one? Uh, five are going to go in yep. round one. top five. Five are going to go. And you want the order. Um, Caleb, obviously, I think is going to be number one. Then yep. there's the discussion of, is it Jaden Daniels or Drake May? All seems to be leading to Jaden Daniels, so I'll go that route. Okay. Then Drake May. And then J.J. McCarthy has been the talk of where is he going to be? Our team's going to trade up for it. And then my fifth is going to be, I know people had Bo Nix in there. I'm going to go Michael Penix Jr. Ah. as the fifth quarterback taken in okay. the first round. So I those like are it. my five. All right, go, Joe. All right. I agree with I agree with Dad here in that there will be five. And by the way, as the uh, the DraftKings Sportsbook betting odds for the NFL draft, they have the over under set at four and a four half. And a half so right. both you and yep. I yep. believe the over is going to hit here. I think we've te seen too much smoke for there not to be fire around that order. I'm going to go Caleb Williams number one overall. I'm going to stand strong and think and Washington's Drake, still going to take yeah, Drake May yeah. at Wouldn't number two. Shy. I'll have uh, <laughs> Jaden Daniels after that. I'll have JJ McCarthy fourth. The fifth quarterback off the board, I'm going to go out on a limb and say Spencer Rattler leaks his way in. Oh. I think they're starting to be a little bit of buzz there is. around yeah, the former is. South yeah. Carolina yeah. quarterback right now. I think there's a lot to like there, and I do wonder how much the injury risk of a guy like Michael Penix Jr., Without that question. history, is going to cost him when it comes to this. So, Dad, you and I both going over with five quarterbacks yeah, in the first definitely round. Definitely going over here. J.J. McCarthy is going to be the wild card on where he goes if someone's going to trade up for him. And then that fifth quarterback – uh, who is it going to be? I say, as I said, Michael Penix. People have put Bo Nix in there and now Spencer Rattler. So both five, little different variation, Claudia. Okay, just so everybody knows, there's no changes. No like changes, <laughs> No, no changes. Uh, four and a half. Wow. So, like you said, the under, you can get plus money at two to one, but books, and you all agree that the over is probably the way it's going to go, juiced at minus 250. Okay, let's go to wide receivers. So I need the order of the top five and how many will be taken in round one. Go, Joe, we'll go you first. And you're pink, by the way. Let's hear it. All right, so the over-under is six and a half for uh, wide receivers in round one. Mm -hmm. mm. I'm going to go under, and I'm going to say it ends up being – are we doing – do you say I have to do the uh, order of this one I want, again? Yeah, order of the top five and then how many. And, yeah, the under is right, juiced order, again. Order, order of the top five, I'll go Marvin Harrison Jr. I still think ends up being the Me first too. off the board. Yep. I'm going to go – this is just a gut feeling. I've seen nothing that would indicate this. But I think Roma Dunze could and should be the second wide receiver off the board. I think I agree with Big you. body, smooth mover, was a huge part of what Washington did offensively in this last season. I just love so much about his game. He moves like a guy much smaller than he actually is at 6'3 and well over 200 pounds. So I'll go him the second one. I'll go Malik Neighbors out of LSU third. And then after that, I'll go A.D. Mitchell out of Texas, the former Georgia transfer there. Right. Clutch player, big moment guy. And then after that, I'll go Brian Thomas, and I'll say Keon Coleman from Florida State <laughs> yep. ends up being the last guy to leak into the first round. I know there's some people that think that maybe Xavier Worthy could leak in there, the other Texas wideout who broke the combine 40-yard uh, dash record. But I, I think the size and ability of Keon Coleman might be too enticing, especially the bottom end of the first at round when you're looking at teams like Kansas City that could potentially be in the mix for adding a true X guy like that. I, 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 don't, I still think Malik Neighbors will be second. I think Rome will be third, Marvin Harrison okay. first. And then remember, how about Brian Thomas you mentioned? That's, that's Malik Neighbors' teammate. Oh, yeah. I mean, two wide receivers going first round, high first round. Uh, I put him next. Uh, before I get to Mitchell, the kid from Texas. So I put Mitchell fifth, Thomas fourth, and then it would be Rome third, Malik Neighbor second, and Marvin Harrison Jr. first. Okay. All right, so also going the under then on six and a half receivers in the first round. Yeah, I'm going under on that. Okay, senior, real quick. So you have Marvin Neighbors. <laughs> 
a doomsday. I'm just trying to keep keep up here. Okay, who is your fourth? Well, he did his like the weirdest order. He gave his fourth one first, then yes. he gave yeah. his second one after I know. that, then he went okay. down to six. Go okay. one through six here. Yeah. We, we ready? I'm sorry, Marvin Harrison Jr. Yeah. Okay, Malik Neighbors, Roma Dunze. Yeah. Uh, then you have Brian Brian Thomas. Okay. And, and then Mitchell. Right. And then Mitchell. Right. Okay. Yes. Okay. And then yep. Gojo, you have for me to keep track. Marvin Harrison, Adunze Neighbors, Mitchell. Am I getting that right? And who is your fifth? Yep. Mitchell, Brian Thomas, and then Keon Coleman. Okay. Yeah. Just need five. So gotcha. Okay. Top. Top threes so, would have worked a lot better. We can would've also, lot, you know, we can also I, I fix these in post so that I, Claudia I doesn't make, have to keep writing I them down. I don't make the rules, okay? I'm not our, the producer. We love our producer, but this was we this rule. Okay, uh, number three. Who will be the first team to trade up or trade down? Senior, what team comes to mind for you? Ooh. So, for me, it's going to be either Minnesota or Denver as okay. far as trading up. They're going to be one of the first teams to trade up. And to trade down, even though New England – I feel has to take a quarterback. They're the one to me that would, you know, now that's been the past. So maybe I shouldn't say that that's been the Bill Belichick era. Uh, so I won't even do that. I'll, I'll say it will be either Minnesota. So I have to pick one yeah. Minnesota, Minnesota okay. will, will, will be the first team to, to trade and they'll trade up. I'll say Minnesota as well. They're armed with a lot of draft capital. They're incredibly motivated to go out there. And I think get one of the best quarterbacks in this draft based on what's happened with their offseason, Kirk Cousins leaning and signing elsewhere and wanting to maintain something close to keeping pace in what's become a very crowded NFC North. All right, fourth question. Will a running back be drafted in the first round? And I want to hear your takes on this. If so, who? I won't hold you to that, but will a running back be drafted in the first round? Let's see if you can hit on a name. I think, we can say, I think we can say this in unison. No. no, yeah. Uh, no. Unfortunately, no. just not the year for that. <laughs> yeah. The over-under for the first round in DraftKings Sportsbook is set at a half. I, yeah. I think we're pretty easily in the clear of that. And it's twofold. One is, this is just not a running back group that's got a Bajan no. Robinson or a Jameer no. Gibbs talent-wise. Uh, ESPN and Mel Kuyper have Jonathan Brooks from Texas. Surprise, surprise, another Texas running back. But he's coming off one an on injury, board. right? Yeah. Coming off an injury. Yeah. Still a really good player. Yeah. Marshawn Lloyd, Blake Corum, Trey Benson out of Florida State, I think could be a guy that ends up going a little bit higher in that group. You're very deep with great guys yeah. in this group. Our guy, Audrick Estime from exactly. Notre Dame. Uh, Ray, uh, uh, Ray Davis from Kentucky. This is one of those where you, I think you're going to find one in that third, fourth, fifth round and up that could hit for you. Because we've seen it. Everyone, we keep, we keep you know, the flashing lights on Isaiah Pacheco yeah. being that seventh rounder and coming in and taking over. And, and then we had two first rounders, obviously, last year, and, and Jameer Gibbs and Bajan Robinson, who both produced very well without question. But, yeah, there's going to be none this year. Yeah, as we've seen the struggle for running backs to time, at times get paid, that changed a little bit this offseason, but not a ton with the cap bump. The most value running backs have still tends to be very early in their career on these first contracts. And so... I'm with you. So, Claudia, yeah, no, I don't think any running backs going in the first round here. I'll continue to beat the drum for Audrick Estime. I mentioned the other name. Ray Davis out of Kentucky yeah. is a guy that I love that I think is part of a backfield rotation. Could be a really interesting player for somebody in addition to Jonathan Brooks and some of these other top names. I do want to know where you think Estime is going, but quickly to talk about the DK odds. The first running back selected is actually Trey Benson out of Florida, 2-1. to one. Jonathan Brooks is tied with him at 2-1. to one. Then Jalen Wright, then Blake Corum. So your guy estimate is pretty far down the board. Any of those names pop out to you guys? You're getting plus money. So decent value just to be uh, the first selected. I think there's going to be a run at some point on running backs. Estimate, you know, I think between like the second and fourth round. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to say probably, you okay. know, in there for if you're asking about Audric Estime, he's going to go in there. And I think he's going to be a pleasant surprise. I think as a lot of these guys will, because obviously the later you go, what happens is after the first round picks where we all know, now what all teams try and do is steal you, right? Yes. If you think you're second-round talent, can you get them in the third round? If you think you're third-round graded talent, can you get them in the fourth round? So that's what starts to happen. These guys start to fall, and they all start getting ticked off. But that's just teams trying to figure out, can we get this guy later than our grade says? Yeah, and, and for some of the other guys in here, like Blake Horham, I love the player. I put him third on my Heisman ballot two years ago. I thought he was the catalyst for Michigan's run to the college football playoff two seasons ago. But he's on the smaller yeah, side, 5'8", 205. He runs tough. like He takes a lot of punishment, and we've seen a lot of wear and tear on him as a player. So I think that might be the concern. There's still going to be a great great Poe 
Trey Benson, the name Claudia mentioned, that's at the top of the odds right there. Right. Probably the smoothest mover yep. of the running backs yep. there just sort of took a back seat because that Florida State offense became so much about that passing attack right. with wide receivers like Johnny Wilson and Keon Coleman and what Jordan Travis was able to do at quarterback. So he came in as one of the biggest known commodities on that offense that just ended up being a lot more about the downfield passing Not attack. Not to digress for a moment, but two guys I want to keep an eye on, one last year and one this year, is Trav Jordan Travis where he goes yeah. as a quarterback and what he does after an injury. And then last year we saw Hendon Hooker, the quarterback, when he yeah. blew his knee out from Tennessee. He's in Detroit. Where these guys end up, or we know where obviously Hooker is, but for Travis and when they start playing, because I think they both could have good futures. Yeah, those are guys that we've talked about in the world where Aiden O'Connell is going to have a chance at the starting job for the Las Vegas Raiders. Obviously the Brock Purdy effect in the NFL of more veteran college players Think a Jordan Travis who's been in school for six years, a Sam Hartman who leaves as one of the most decorated passers in ACC history and came over for one year at Notre Dame. All of these guys, I think, represent a high floor that's become somewhat appealing for NFL teams to take a flyer on that could be good mid-round, uh, mid-round guys, Claudia. And you guys said it in unison, but it is very unlikely that a running back goes in the first round. Plus a 900 at DraftKings is the price on that. Last um, one. Who will be the first defensive player off the board right now? Alabama edge Dallas Turner is the favorite, pretty heavy favorite, too, at minus 190, Gojo. Yeah, uh, I'm probably going to side with Dallas Turner uh, on this one, Dad. I think there's going to maybe be some question whether it's him or Jared Verse, the Florida yep. State pass rusher, who uh, a little bit bigger build, I think a little bit more in the terms of uh, run defense. But Dallas Turner since last year, when you watched him opposite Will Anderson Jr., who ended up becoming a top five pick to the Houston Texans, posed such a captivating watch because – in comparison to Will, who was ruthlessly efficient, who was incredibly experienced, who was a stellar run defender, a tackle for loss monster in addition to the sack production, he was a guy that because he was so efficient and maybe not the gaudiest athlete, was kind of a boring watch. And I, I say that overwhelmingly admitting he was a guy I loved Houston picking that high in the draft because he's a great player. Dallas Turner on the other side is a phenomenal athlete. Like, he's the kind of tools and gifts that people are always searching for on the edge. It never became production-wise what Will had done, but I always found myself when I was watching Will Anderson, and then even this, la this last year when it was Chris Braswell and Dallas Turner on the edges, the things he does athletically just so naturally are the kinds of things that you can't coach. And I think that skill set combined with the pedigree of coming from a program like Alabama are going to make him the first defensive player. Yeah, the first two defensive players are going to be edge rushers. It's going to be Dallas Turner and Jared Verse from Florida State. I think that's... and I I think Dallas Turner will be first. Jared Verse and I think two of the top three first defensive players off the board are going to be from Alabama. Uh, it'll be yeah. Dallas Turner and then Terry and Arnold, yeah. the cornerback from Alabama. So I think that, yeah, two of the first three will be Alabama. Dallas Turner, I think, will be first off the board as well. And Claudia, I have to ask you, for those that will be listening on the podcast, she has a like a box in front of her putting all our stuff in a time capsule. Mm -hmm. And the time capsule, Claudia, looks like so, like you got a bottle of wine from somebody in that box. You just slid the top off, took the wine out, and put our picks in that in that wine box. Okay, again, guys, I did not come up with the questions. I also did not bring this box here, so you got to talk with the guys behind the scenes. All right, because I didn't plan any of this. But I think give, it's pretty awesome. giving away the magic and, of the time and, cap? And, she, and, is, and, she is quick. <laughs> it might be a wine box, but it but it's our time capsule. So... She is quickly pointing the finger and not pulling the thumb. I here mean, because you're uh, looking to bl well, blame somebody I'm, I'm for what's a perfectly saying, good box and idea. That's a wine box. Well, that's a wine box. Why can't you suspend yeah. disbelief right now? I need you to like <laughs> let the audience in on the magic of our time capsule here, and you're trying to degrade it. You're trying to take it down a notch. What the hell's wrong with you? Well, actually, wine box. but also, okay. it, it might be. But think about when people do the message in a bottle. Right? That's a former yeah. model of some sort. So maybe uh, I think that our producer, Matt Durgan, really put thought into this. And he's like, if we do a wine box, then it's sort of so like a did, message in a bottle. It is like did, a message in a bottle did, of sorts. Did we, put a thought, did we put any thought process in the fact of what do you do with a time capsule? You bury it, right? Yeah. You bury that wood in a time capsule and leave it there for any amount of time. It's going to disintegrate and everything in it's going to disintegrate. Yeah, you thought we were going to really okay. bury our time capsule. That's what you do with a time capsule. Is that what you did with any of the time capsules that we made when I was in elementary yes. school? Yes, so what, no, you yes. Didn't, they're you didn't in the backyard. It. They're, 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 they're buried lying. in the backyard. You're lying, you're Along lying with to the hamster and you know some of the other pets we had. The hamster's in the lake. 
lake. You threw that into the water. Well, we had a, we had uh, yeah, it's true. That was growing up at my house oh, in no. Cleveland. We had a we had a hamster that we buried in the backyard. Chips, mm. was his name. Rest in peace, Chips. Yeah. And oh. rest in peace, Zippity, uh, who Zippity. was unceremoniously Zippity. thrown into the water uh, after my brother might have accidentally uh, murdered him. It was a yeah. it was a whole oh. thing. It it's wasn't a, a great thing. period yeah. for us. What I will say about defensive players before we completely move off the time capsule here yeah. is, I think. <laughs> Outside of the edge guys that we talked about, where you've got Dallas Turner that's obviously going to be in there. You mm-hmm. mentioned Jared Versley, Atu Latu, who we had on the show from yes. UCLA, yeah, who is yeah. an incredibly impressive young man, a great story of a career that was almost derailed by a neck injury, and now comes back and comes in as one of the most complete pass rushers in terms of an arsenal of pro-ready moves, a guy who understands and operates in his rush plan each and every down like a professional player. Maybe you just have some of the injury concerns. Maybe you have some run game concerns or high-end athleticism concerns that don't exist for Dallas and Jared Verse. I think he's going to be incredibly productive. And then dad along the interior. As a former defensive tackle, oh. we've got some really compelling guys yeah. in this class and Newton coming out of Illinois, yeah. but I think Byron Murphy's Murphy going to end up being Texas. the first defensive tackle off what, the board. What a specimen he is. You talk about wow. hey, you talk about the value of the combine. I do think there's some people that watch the way Byron Murphy come next to those other D tackles on the field. Where again, yeah. you're usually watch, you're watching him next to Tavondre Sweat, another guy that's going to be an NFL defensive tackle, won right. the Outland Award at D tackle at 360 something pounds for the Texas Longhorns. But looking at the combine and seeing Byron Murphy out there next to all of these guys, next to Braden Fisk, the uh, D-tackle from, from Florida, Florida State, State. Yeah. that probably helped himself yeah. out by how he looked, ran, and moved there, you saw Byron Murphy moving next to those other guys and said one of these things is not yeah. like the other. And when you combine that with what – I mean, you talked to Texas coaches around there since he came as a freshman, and they pointed out 90 and burnt orange and said this dude is special. Like this dude is going to be something different. And he ended up being part of Texas's football renaissance in the trenches. He goes to the combine and all of a sudden starts to get that comparison to other people side by side, which is what you get there. And now all of a sudden, I do think he has cemented himself as the number one D tackle that he wasn't to start draft season. I saw his play when I watched him actually on the field and his quickness. It reminded me of like a big guy like a Jordan Davis, you know, at Georgia and now at the Eagles, who's bigger, you know, um, but had that quickness as well. And you just saw the way he moved with his feet and the way he used his hands and you thought... He's someone special. So, okay, we can move off this. I still want to know where the wine went for the wine box in our time capsule, but I'll leave that for another day. I don't understand what your obsession with demeaning our time capsule is. Everyone worked very hard on this time capsule here. We're going to sit around. Worked and cover- hard on the time capsule. I had wine. It's a wine box. It's a wine box. And after the show, I'm sure Slates is going to cover it in glue and glitter and make it beautiful. And so, so we have when a project, at, an art project. Yeah, have a, we have an project. art project so okay. we can open it back up in all the right. draft and we can look at our takes and see how right we were on all this stuff. Dad, knee-jerk reaction coming off all this. Which of these takes are you most worried about getting old takes exposed and looking bad by the time we get to the draft? Oh, wow. Uh, the defensive ones I'm fine with. No running backs in the first round I'm fine with. The one I'm not sure about the most is going to be who trades first. Because that, that, that could be a crapshoot. I mean, it, it could be Denver. It could be someone in the first five trading back. You know, so that's the one I feel uh, the least secure about. I, I think the one that's, I, I think the wild card in that, one of the biggest wild cards in the draft could be the New York Giants then, sitting down yep. there at six. Yep. Since everything we've heard out of them, or at least being involved in the first trade of the draft. Because we have seen every opportunity they've gotten, whether it was the whispers coming out of the combine that made their way up through Rich Eisen that – they were done with right, Daniel, Daniel Jones. Jones that, right. that was the word coming out of the combine. One of the rumors that Rich Eisen heard around the combine that he does coming into his show every week. And then after that, we heard John Mara come out at the NFL owners meeting and basically say, hey, I've told our staff, if you guys love one of these quarterbacks, you've got the green light to go and get one. Dad, if I was looking to trade up and get a quarterback in this draft, the last thing I'd be doing is telling everyone, hey, we're looking to trade up and get a quarterback in this draft. So I think they're trying to make some people nervous, and I think they're going to factor into who ends up jumping to try and get a J.J. McCarthy potentially in this draft or a Drake May if he falls. That's the name to me. Before the season started, nobody, I, I, I don't think, do we think was anybody talking about JJ McCarthy being a first round quarterback? Oh god no. Now he's Jaden Daniels too. Now he's right, Jaden Daniels, but at least Jaden Daniels you saw the possibility sure. there. JJ McCarthy just cuz they don't throw a lot so there wasn't a lot of sample size and now all of a sudden it's people have Minnesota trading up to 4 to get him. So possibly the first four picks of the draft could be quarterback. A lot of interesting all inside the wine box seen around the world. <laughs> Coming up next, we'll talk about a guy who likes a lot of wine, who also may not have much time left here on Gojo and Goalie.
Golick. We continue our starch madness bracket. In case you didn't know, we are crowning the best fast food of all fast food. We asked, you answered. We have the results from the main Eat 8 voting over the weekend. Chick-fil-A, okay, spicy chicken sandwich. Defeated McDay's quarter pounder to move on to the foodie four. That one shocks me a little bit, but we do all have an all McDonald's matchup with the fries versus hash browns in the Eat 8 side region. You can vote now at Gojo and Golik on Twitter. I am a little surprised. I know Chick-fil-A is banging, but I really expected it just to be McDonald's through and through till the end, guys. So this is what I talked about on Friday. I mean, I've probably had five times as many double quarter pounders with cheese than I have Chick-fil-A spicy sure. chicken sandwiches. But the spicy chicken sandwich is better. It, oh, yeah. It, it, better quality by far. It's just better. So mm -hmm. I, I had to go with my, with my taste buds here over my nostalgia of so much McDonald's that I've eaten. And I voted for the, the Chick-fil-A spicy chicken sandwich. It moves on. Congrats to them. McDonald's is, is a heavy hitter in a few of these categories, as well as the one we're going to start, obviously, today. Uh, but they got knocked off, and I think that was the right vote. Yeah, absolutely the right vote. Uh, you guys got this one right, America, and uh, whatever other countries also voted in well, this. We exactly. don't discount Gojo and Golok listeners all across this not. world. Uh, the one today is going to be interesting, and I think it was good because McDonald's was always going to be represented yeah. the Foodie 4. They've yeah. dominated the sides region. We've got the 1-2 matchup of fries versus hash browns there. Dad, I think fries are going to run away and hide away. with this. Fries probably, we had them in a play-in tournament for the one seed in the sides region. I think you could make an argument with a one seed overall. Yeah. I think when people think fast food, they tend to think fries before most all else, and I think that's going to bear out in this tournament. I think they're going to what? McDonald's hash brown, a great treat. It is. A staple of fast food breakfast, but absolutely going to get ragdolled. I think this is going to be an absolute destruction, so fries are going to get into the foodie four, correct? Yes, the foodie four. Now? Uh, just like the Chick-fil-A uh, a spice chicken sandwiches in the foodie four now as well. So yeah, I, I completely agree with this. Fries is going to move on. Fries may be tough to beat. Uh, McDonald's fries may be tough to beat overall. I agree. Yeah. So going to be tough there. Vote at Gojo and Golik. The voting is up now. It just got started. Fries already jumping out to a very early lead in this one. While we worry about what we're going to eat, Claudia, the sirens started going off last night around our former employer ESPN, I'm sure, but really every outlet that covers professional basketball. Because anytime LeBron James speaks in general, it is noteworthy. But when LeBron James speaks about the end of his career yeah. potentially being near, Claudia, we are all moths to the flame. Even though, should we really be shocked? He's been playing forever. So when he says no. the end is coming, it's like, well, yeah. Um, but of course, this came after he goes off as if he just entered the league. He beat the Nets yesterday with nine threes. Nine for ten behind the arc. Tied his career high for three-pointers. Matched his season high 40 points. And then, of course, he was asked, how much longer are you going to keep beating up on guys in the NBA? Here's what he had to say. Not very long. Not very long. I'm on the other side, obviously at a hill, so uh, I'm not going to play another 21 years. That's for damn sure, but uh, not very long. Um, I don't know what, uh, when that door will close as far as my, when I'll retire, but I don't have much time left. I have to say, and I feel like I'm maybe overstepping here, but if he wasn't balding, if you look how his body is, his cardio, like the way he acts, you would never think he is the age he is. But he is getting older, so, uh, guys. What is <laughs> Well, what, what, what are you? Uh, what are, uh, I'm what just, are you saying about balding I'm, people, Claudia? No, no. Huh? I'm, what no. are you saying? All I'm saying is that's what came to mind. It doesn't help mind. you look young, younger. <laughs> what uh -huh. I'm saying I'm, is, I'll say it for the way yeah, that yeah. he's. What are you playing, saying? The way that he is mm -hmm. playing, you would uh, never know uh. that he is nearing the end, but he is. And Gojo, it's not surprising so, when somebody asks him that he's saying, "Yeah, it's coming up." So. So because no. Mike is not playing anything and he's bald, he looks older than he is. Yes, is Dad, congratulations. Is that, that what you wanted out there? Is that there? what you're trying to say, yes. Claudia? congratulations. No, I, I'm asking No, that's what you're what trying Claudia. to say. Listen. That's what you're trying I don't know to what, say. I think that's what Claudia's trying, trying to say. You've been, listen, you've been coming at the wine box a lot. Wow. You've been coming at Claudia a lot here. You've been a bully today. I, you're gonna bully today. I'm just trying to find out the truth. Jesus is the reason for the season, and when Christ has come <laughs> back, he rolled the rock out, and this is how you want him to see you right now. It's childish. Easy. I just watched the Ten Commandments. On, uh, uh, we'll easy. get to yeah, your love yeah, of yeah, the Ten yeah, Commandments yeah. here, but uh, no, this Claudia's right. This isn't surprising at all. No. And neither is what happened last night. LeBron James scores 40 points last night. He joins Michael Jordan now right. as the only players north of 40 in the NBA that have scored or scored 40 plus after the age of 39. Yeah, right. Even at this point, Michael Jordan has three such three outings. Times. LeBron now has two such outings here. And you know he's going to break that one. 
At Absolutely. Yeah. And the way he did it last night, Dad, I think the, the thing that continues to impress about LeBron James, no matter what your opinion's been of him over the years, he's been lumped into the Jordan goat debate for so long that I think even people that would otherwise support a great player in their time kind of war against LeBron because to them he represents the threat to Michael. But doing it last night, career high nine threes. He went nine of ten from yeah. three in this game in something that's never been LeBron's bag. No. I've always said when LeBron starts hitting threes in a game, you just shut the controller yeah. off on your yeah. other side. Get ready to rage quit because then it makes him unstoppable. Because as he said, he can score at all three levels. Any he can do possible. everything else. Right. He can score any way possible once he crosses half court. And threes are usually not the game. I'm with you. So, yeah, when he starts doing that, you just kind of throw up your hands. But it's still amazing that we talk about what LeBron does and when he's not in, what, what AD does for this team. And then we talk about Golden State, you know, the Draymond Green drama at times, but still how great Steph is. They're on a four-game winning streak right now. And they're both 9-10 still. Right. They're, they're both headed to the play-in game. Golden State has a two-game lead over Houston for that 10-11 spot. We only have about eight games left in the regular season. And the Lakers, you know, they're, they're, they're one and a half games half out of seven from, behind Phoenix, the Suns. So they it, could improve their station in the play. They, they can, but we've been saying that now for the last 10, 20 games, and they stayed in their exact same positions of nine and 10. So I think we're still, I, I want to see it in all honesty. So I want to see them stay at nine and 10 sure. and play in that first play in game. I think it's funny that we talk so long, ever since LeBron's come over to Los Angeles, the cry has been, space the court with shooters around one of the greatest passers of all time. And the Lakers have never really gone all in on that style as they brought Anthony Davis over. And now you've got a team where, hey, D'Angelo Russell can get hot from three every once in a while. But you look at Austin Reeves and Rui and the rest of these guys, not knock down three pointers like you would think of. And so LeBron's basically evolved to say, I'll do this in some form to try and help us get over the hump here. Part of me always wonders when LeBron says something like this, how much of it is a direct message to the front office, especially going into this summer where we know the Lakers have a bunch of picks to work with. We've talked about their ability to go out and add another star to this lineup to try and make one last go with the LeBron James era of the Lakers. How much of this is that constant reminder of, hey, we don't have time to dilly-dally, and so whatever move you're thinking of, ratchet it up even more because I'm not going to be here that much longer. Better chance of a play-in team making a move in the playoffs. Lakers, Warriors, and let's assume, even though I know you're not supposed to, that Joel Embiid comes back, 76ers, who are, who are going to be in the play-in scenario as well. I would probably still say it's Golden State just because of the three-pointer of it all. Like, I think at the end of the day now, when it's the kind of thing we're talking about where, for anyone that's unfamiliar, the 7 and 8 seed play in the play-in tournament, the winner of that moves on, and then the loser of that plays the winner of the 9-10 game. So if you're the Lakers or the Warriors, you're going to have to win we two pull. games to right. actually make the playoffs right. coming out of the play-in tournament. And so it's closer to single elimination, which means it's kind of like March Madness, a little bit of anything can go. But in general, I always think the Lakers are more of a bad math problem. And unless they get a night like that from LeBron James, which is possible, or a night like that from D'Angelo Russell that we've seen down the stretch. Certainly possible in the play-in scenario. It, it right? is, but I yeah. still think Golden State and their style of play, even as we've seen it wax and wane a bit with Steph Curry, has more of that potential overall than the Lakers do. I would agree, and it's hopefully Draymond Green can stay on the court. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that would certainly be a plus. Can't count on it at this point. But I agree. But I'm still intrigued if Joel Embiid does come back and gets in a little bit of playing shape uh, for the playoffs if they become a little more formidable uh, in, in the East. Yeah, it's just, man, it's a lot of it it's is a lot built to into ask. that. And I, 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 I get, get like, you know, Ty, yeah. listen, Tyrese Maxey has done a phenomenal yeah. job. I, I heard earlier your former partner on College yep. Football Saturday Nights, Kate Scott, who does a great job as one of the voices of the Sixers. Everyone there's talked about, hey, Tyrese has taken all these opportunities of James Harden leaving and stepping up into a role. And then Joel Embiid going down for a lion's share of the back half of the season and stepping up into a main role. So his growth is a yeah. huge value add for this team if and when they do get Joel back. I think it's just having to do too much in too short amount of time with a guy that's been racking up lower body injuries Clock this season. Clock ticking on all those teams, right, with the age of Steph yeah. and LeBron and certainly the injury uh, history for Joel Embiid. Yeah, as we near the NBA postseason, there's a couple teams looking for a savior. Coming up next, we will talk about my father's favorite holiday movie of all time, including one of the biblical saviors.
Mario and Golik. We talked about Easter off the top of the show, but we didn't really get to get into it. I just mentioned that I love seeing you guys together over there. And I was away for most of the week last week, so I really missed you. I was in Florida catching some rays and got back to Boston, and it's 30 degrees and probably snowing this week. So that's fun. But you guys ah. are together, and it's pretty warm over there, right? Uh, it's well, it's been pouring down rain the last yeah. couple of days okay. in Arizona, yeah. which is a little <laughs> underwhelming. It is rare, though, the holiday that we don't associate because most you think about a lot of the holidays, whether it's Halloween, certainly Christmas, Thanksgiving, they're all associated with the weather changing for the worse, getting colder, getting a little bit darker. And so, we get this Easter holiday that I was thinking about it yesterday and talking about this with my sister Sydney is basically just pastel Halloween, right? Like, excluding yeah. the religious element, please, God, I don't need anyone coming from me no. on that, but in terms of like the part of the secular side that everyone just celebrates with the Easter eggs and the bunny and all that stuff. It's just pastel Halloween. It's the bizarre overall version of a holiday that's largely based around candy and one guy in a you know Easter bunny costume. The Easter bunny is real if any children are listening to this. But I, I, I yeah. think overall it's nice because it's associated with warm weather. Like that and the 4th of July are really the only So Claudia being down in Florida, very on brand. It's about spring. It's about rebirth and renewal. thing about it is too with the Easter bunny. The Easter bunny has a harder job than Santa. How do you figure? Santa has a sleigh and reindeer pulling him. Easter Bunny's got to hop everywhere. Mm. Easter, seriously. Yeah. Easter Bunny's got to hop everywhere. Easter Bunny's got nothing carrying him around. He's got to hop everywhere. We really don't know much about Easter Bunny lore. Like, well, Santa I mean, does a much better job of I, adding I, lore. I agree with that, but right now our thought process is we don't see the Easter Bunny traveling on anything, so he's got to hop to get where he wants to go, Claudia. And the Easter, has, the Easter Bunny has to hide eggs, and Santa just throws it under the tree. It's a lot, so, of, it's a lot more. I, it's a lot, I think it's a little more difficult. And listen, in the Golik household, my wife, your mother, has been preparing Easter, uh, Easter baskets for everybody for all. She's still doing it. You're 34, yeah. the oldest. Yeah. Jake is 33. Sydney is 29. All three got baskets yesterday. Uh, Jenny, uh, my, your sister-in-law, my daughter-in-law, Ben, my son-in-law, your bro brother-in-law, got baskets. Jackson, of course, 21-year-old grandson, got a basket. 21-month-old. 21-month-old, got a basket. And Alex, four-month-old, got a basket. Everybody got a basket. And you're right, it's, pa it's, that, that, it's pastel Halloween with the type of candy in there. Now, my Same favorite setup. candy growing up of all time was the solid white chocolate bunny. Solid mm. chocolate, though. Where white you just chocolate, really? White chocolate. It was I a like solid it. white chocolate bunny you just gnawed on because it was solid. And then when you don't eat it all, you put it in the freezer and kind of freeze it and hang on to it. So wait, you're just talking about how solid it is. You got to gnaw on it. The whole point is to gnaw on it until it starts to get warm enough that it breaks off and then you can eat it in bigger chunks here. You want to gnaw on a I'm frozen eating, hunk of I'm, chocolate these are, and neuter these a lot were, of the great taste of it? These were huge. Oh, I know you, what you they are. I've had all. a chocolate bunny before. I couldn't eat them all in one sitting, so I put it in the freezer and then to, to keep that it. That sounds like a you problem. Well, it worked for me. You know me and sweets. You ever think I have a problem with sweets? Well, yeah, you do. You're type 2 diabetic. No. Well, okay. Well, right. Besides that, why do you got to let the truth get in the way of a good story? I, just, okay? I mean, you do have a problem with sweets. Right, I have whatever. a problem with sweets, too. Whatever. Every time I a lot of baskets the in there with a lot of candy me. still. That's Realize. all I got to say. I will say, uh, too, uh, t as far as candy takes, it's a good reminder to tell people the Reese's Holiday Shapes, the superior Reese's to the actual Reese's Cup. Yeah. I would say the Reese's Egg probably near the top of that list, although I think the Christmas tree recently has come up and edged it out a little bit. Just a lot of different contours in there. It gives you a little bit of a different roll of the dice. I've grown to love the Starburst-flavored jelly beans. Oh, yeah, that's a staple yeah. around here. Yeah. We put a, my mom cannot refill the, like the candy dish fast enough with the Starburst jelly and beans. And there is nothing that alerts the dog. There's five dogs in our house all day yesterday. We have oh. three, and uh, Sydney and Ben have two. They have two bulldogs. Uh, we have a bulldog and two pugs. You reach your hand in that jelly bean jar, and it makes that sound. The dogs just jump up. My, They're ready to go. Well, this is my question. Is Mom said, oh, yeah, they love jelly beans. Are you guys feeding them jelly beans? They occasionally get a jelly bean treat. We don't overdo it. We feed them no chocolate. Dogs, no chocolate. Occasionally, we will give them a jelly bean treat. Very rarely, though. I mean, no wonder the pugs have like three teeth left. You've rotted Listen, them with candy. Don't, don't talk to me how my dogs are in bad shape because of me, okay? We're loving parents to these dogs. That's why I come they live here a great and life. they run to me as if no, it's don't. salvation. I saw, in front listen, of them. I saw Harry the Pug pee on your leg. Okay? That's all I need to say. It's completely untrue. No, it's, it's, an it's a complete true. fabrication. It's not, it's not at all. 
I'm Not loving I'm loving the candy takes. I really want to get seniors take on movies, but quickly, I'm just curious with the baskets, do they evolve with age? Like do you get, you know, little alcohol balls well, when you turn 21 or is it just candy? No, no. Okay. No, there's enough alcohol around the house, let alone doesn't have to be in the basket. <laughs> gotcha. Like Mike's basket was different than everybody else because Mike likes peeps. Oh. And I don't yeah. think anybody else does. So That's we know true. what his basket is. Like Jackson's truck, he's a, a, a basket. He's 21 months old. He loves trucks. He mm. loves planes. So that's full of those kind of toys for him as well as some candy. So, yeah, it, it kind of goes to the person. Okay. My wife does a great job of that. Yeah, no, right. they also get dressed down a little. Like, there's not as much candy right, in there right, because, right. again, I have a doctor's appointment. It's my first physical with a new doctor I'm seeing out in California. And it's luck. like a first date where you can't fart. I have to go in there and try and act like I'm very put together. It's called pre-diabetes. Yeah, exactly. No, I have to. <laughs> I, I, thankfully, I think they didn't ask for a blood draw yet, so we don't have to have that conversation <laughs> right out of the gate about my cholesterol because they're going to see that coming over from the last doctor. So I've got to try and maintain some semblance of adulthood out here, which means slowly going through the limited candy supply there, Claudia, so that when I show up to the doctor, I don't embarrass myself on this first date. Okay, but so what, you fart on a second date? Like, I thought that was really just... Yeah, yeah. I mean... I, you know what? It's a good question. At, you know, at Gojo and Golik on Twitter, when do you start farting <laughs> around your significant other? Definitely I never, not the second I never date. Do that <laughs> You got you got to well, wait. No, yeah, I like, mean, you know. I, yeah. I I never do that around your mother. My my poor mom. <laughs> She's got acquainted oh, with the term say, Dutch really? oven faster you guys, than anyone should. You guys should. share each no, other's no, bath no, water. God, no. I find it hard to believe. No. Yeah. <laughs> it, the fart has gone from a gaseous state yeah. to a liquid yeah. state, <clears throat> and thankfully will not be a solid in no. the tub. That's for a not. different bowl of water in the bathroom Disgusting. there. Just um, the other thing that comes with Thanksgiving every year, I was thinking about this too as we talked about Thanksgiving just being pastel Halloween, is there aren't a lot of Thanksgiving movies out there Easter, outside Easter. of one, and it's every... <laughs> Easter, Easter movies, Easter, excuse right. me. Yeah, yeah. Easter, Easter, Easter. Thanksgiving, Jesus Christ, <laughs> is the reason for the Whoa, season. Oh, yeah. Um, Easter movies, yep. The Ten Commandments. Yep. It's the only one that every year, as soon as it's on, my father turns to without fail and will watch start to finish. There are two movies during two holidays that never that I never miss. Uh, during Christmas, A Christmas Story, sure. which is on on uh, one channel for 24 hours yeah, straight. Yeah, that one's easy. And then around Easter, it's The Ten Commandments. Because my goal is to look like Moses. I want the long hair. I want, the, hair. I want the white hair. I have dressed up like Moses in a TV football game booth on a Halloween. I have dressed up. I, my wife bought a great Moses outfit I've worn a couple of times. I want the white in my beard, which I get, which I have. I, I, want my, I want my hair to turn completely white at some point, and I want a staff, and I want that robe, and I'm just going to walk around and have you guys call me Moses for the last 10 years of my life. I can promise you one part of that's not going to happen. What's that? We're not going to call you Moses. Come on! It, in addition to being what I'd imagine is kind of sacrilegious, it's also just a little bit clunky for us. Yeah. So we're going to go away from that. The rest of it, like, dog, the white hair and the beard, it, it's here. Like, you have whiter hair and whiter beard than the Moses in the Ten Commandments movie <laughs> and I love coming it. back from the burnt bush, where all of a sudden he's got the like the white streaks in his got hair. that look in his face. You have far oh, yeah. exceeded yeah. the amount of white in your facial hair and yeah, beard. Yeah, so he, came down from, he came down from the mountain and said, time to save people. He's a mass, I, I got the word. I got the word from I am that I am. Go save the slaves. I, you know what? The one thing I will say, those Egy Egyptians were dressing. They were getting fits off in this movie. Yule Brenner, who played Moses' yeah. you know, pseudo brother in this, he looked good. Yeah, oh, you said he everyone was jacked really in this movie. Yeah. Everyone was getting like all the gold in these outfits. Yeah. I hope it won some sort of Academy Award for costume design. Yeah, I don't know. This deserved. movie was made in 1956. Staying power. I mean, just phenomenal. Absolutely love the movie. One of the great movies of all time. The, the only problem is. In this day and age, for people your age and Claudia's age, they'd never be able to watch it all the way through because it's like over three hours long. Yeah, it is. Uh, it long, is like the long, Bible. It's a very long read. Yeah. So <laughs> it, uh, it it's one of the rare movies that decided not to skip out on much of the source no, material here no. and just include all of that in it whenever humanly possible. Hope everyone had a great Easter weekend. Coming up next, we'll talk to Emerson Lazia, who had an even better weekend next.
All right, time to finish off the show the way we always do. This, that, the third, three quick stories to send you into the rest of your day. As always, make sure you download, subscribe, rate, review us, leave us a five-star rating, and check us out here live Monday through Friday from 8 to 10 a.m. Eastern. You can also catch the best of Gojo and Golik, noon to 1 p.m. Eastern, wherever you hear VSIN on the radio, so be sure to check that out. Also, if you miss any of our show, our great guest, thank you to our buddy and my former ESPN yep. radio co-host, Chinea Gwumike, who joined us to recap some of what's going on in March Madness. You can check out her, Andrea Carter, and L. Duncan, one of the best desks covering sports Big that we have right tonight. now. Big, Big night, night tonight, tonight coming up. Yeah. Again, as we look forward to Caitlin Clark in Iowa against Angel Reese's LSU squad in what's sure to be one of the biggest games of the year. You can get all that wherever you get your podcast or available right here on YouTube as soon as we get done. Guys, let's start off with this, that, and the third and revisit something that happened last week. Claudia, you mercifully did not have oh, to be around so to hear the admission from our buddy and teammate here, Emerson Lazia, who talked about the fact that for the last nine years, he has only worn two pairs of underwear that were gifts from his mother. He's got an orange pair and a blue pair, and it launched a very worthwhile discussion about how many pairs of underwear should an adult person own Emerson Lazio decided not to just rest on his own opinions or our own opinions. He took this one to the streets and asked the people the most important question. How many pairs of underwear do you own? How's your bracket looking, by the oh, way? Complete that's, why I <laughs> that's why I gamble on DraftKings. Yeah! <laughs> what do you think the average pairs of underwear for an average person fans? owns? Probably 10 to 15. Okay. I'm at probably 30 to 40. Damn, 30 to 40? Yeah. Do you even make it past like 15 or 20? Like how do you, do you just keep a bunch of fresh underwear to the side? Yeah. What would you say to a man who maybe owns just two pairs of underwear for the last nine years? Watch your ass. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? How's your bracket looking, by the way? I don't do the brackets, I just gamble on DraftKings. <laughs> you just wear one all yeah, week I long? Yeah, wash it in the sink. You know, rink it, oh rinse it out. It, yeah, every Was that you with your hat asking people for change over here earlier. <laughs> what know. is it about you guys that are that is so kind and gentle? Hell yeah! <laughs> Welcome to Boston. You're gonna fit in perfectly. How many pairs of underwear do you own? Uh, two. Yes! Oh my God! Yes! I own two as well, and I've been given crap for it all week. Two is tough. <laughs> Keep them clean. Hand wash at least. <laughs> Rest in peace! Rest in peace! Are you wearing underwear? No. Yeah! <laughs> yeah! Let's go! Oh, no one person has ever been more in their glory than Emerson getting to ask strangers about their underwear. I, I, two times, two times people said hand wash them. Are we in the 1800s here? You don't have to hand wash your clothes anymore, gang. You don't have to do that. We I mean, Dan Hurley brought machines. a single road washer but, for but, his underwear, which is he, weird. He's not scrubbing them in the sink. He's throwing it into something. Who the hell hand washes anything? Claudia, your face is horrified. You weren't here for any of this. How did you take in everything that's happened well, with this? You know, guys, I like woke up in the morning in Florida. It was beautiful on the beach. I'm sitting there scrolling, and then I see this video, and I felt repulsed. I didn't even reply. I didn't even text Emerson to be like, what is wrong with you? I can't even fathom the fact that he has two pairs over the last nine years and the fact that other men as well, men and women, I'm sorry, but that is downright nasty. I think we need to send him a care package and that other man who said he owns two pairs. I think there's one other thing we need to bring up. He said for nine years, how, I, and I don't know how old Emerson is, so let's go nine years old. Nine years ago, how old he was then? I think Emerson's like 40. So All nine right. years ago, he so, was like so let's in say his early was, 30s. Let's say he was 31. And he said nine years ago, he had two pair of underwear that his mom bought him. Yeah. So he's a 31-year-old man All right, where his mother I bought him. Has your mother in the last three years, you're 34, bought you any underwear? No, but she's bought me and you plenty of clothes. So. No, but then there's clothes Hey, Mike, I bought you this nice shirt. Not, hey, Mike, I, I bought you this thong underwear. Right. I mean, <laughs> seriously. Why are you giving Emerson thong underwear I don't now? know, Who but that mom you, is buying... He showed us his underwear. They're not thongs. <laughs> mom what? is buying his underwear when he's in his right. 30s? You know what I'll say is around the holidays at this point, I would prefer underwear and socks as gifts. Like, I'll just say it. Like, we don't replenish the supplies on those things nearly enough. So if anyone's listening in my family, I'll take that every day and twice on Sunday. We could sit here and talk about drawers yeah. all day. Claudia, let's get to that and explore another very important topic, which is 
baseball players takes on reality television because Joey Votto really let me down yesterday. Yeah, so Joey Votto, we talked about him finally getting picked up by the Blue Jays, and as the social media team does, they stand outside, ask players certain things. So this time around, they are asking players about the most recent show they watched. Joey Votto says, well, love is blind, and he had some apparently, according to Gojo, hot takes. So I thought about it, and the last show I actually binge watched was Love is Blind. And I just don't under understand so first of all clay you did the right thing you don't have to get married after two weeks it's fine it's fine you can continue a date and get to know one another and then decide in the future so don't feel bad about yourself you didn't have to cry nobody, nobody needs to be upset it's just two weeks jimmy and chelsea i mean i thought they were a match made in heaven jimmy you're like i love you i love you i want to be with you forever i love you i love you and then on the last show you break our hearts? Thanks, Jimmy. Why is that? I'm sorry, doing? Joey. I don't get it either. I anyone who looked at Jimmy and Chelsea and thought, yeah, that's a match made in heaven. Those people definitely need to be together in a relationship after watching that show. I, 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 I have a lot of questions for you. I think you need help because I watched that and said both of them need to run screaming in the other direction. I don't know what the hell you want me to say. I watched one season of this and haven't watched it since. I think All I watched just, season two. This this does nothing for me. The fact that just what Joey said, two weeks and you're supposedly in love. It's kind well, of like hey. the Bachelor or Bachelorette. You're together, what, six, seven, eight weeks? The and all of a sudden, I'm in love with three people. Now I narrow it down to one, and I and I propose it. At Joey person. did a great job this season, Joey, by the way. He's yeah, a great yeah, bachelor. Yeah, whatever. Had a really good time with him. And with the Clay thing, it's not what he did. It's how he did it. Anyone who watched Clay and AD knows that AD deserved a lot better than what she got. Clay was looking for her to come in and fix all of his problems here. Kudos to him for doing the work now, but just doing the work and then automatically imagining, uh, anticipating this person that you slighted would come back and just accept all of that and not feel any of the hurt that she felt or how she was led along in that process. Unfair to AD, who is one of the stars of that season. Claudia, so. Claudia, please get into the third here so we can stop. Yeah, why don't we do that? Here. Cowboy Carter. Ah, let's do it. Beyonce Sr., I don't know how much you can talk about this one either, uh, but Cowboy Carter, new album that came out over the week, or Thursday, I should say. Over the weekend, it's already breaking records. It broke streaming records on Spotify and Amazon over the weekend. Um, I, I don't know. I, I guess that's impressive. People are somehow mad at the fact that Beyonce is putting out country music. I don't know. Are you bothered by this, Senior? Why, why would I? If, a, I haven't listened to the album. I, I knew she did the, the country song and then it was going to turn it into an album. She, she, listen, she's an unbelievable talent. Who cares if she went and did a country album? I mean, wow, people, people get mad at the dumbest stuff. I mean, they yeah. really do. I mean, so what if she did that? Like I said, I haven't listened to him. I can't break any of it down, but I know what a talent she is. And if she wanted to go a little country in this album, hey, kudos to you. Have a ball. Yeah, uh, artists of her caliber and bending genres are sh nothing new. It's an incredible album, wall to wall. It really is a complete work. It flows incredibly well together. It's 27 tracks, some of which are like small interlude tracks and stuff in between, but the kind of people on here, Miley Cyrus, Rumi Carter, her daughter, Dolly Parton, Willie Nelson on this, she leans <laughs> all the way in and I think pays homage to a genre yeah, that yeah. has a ton of its foundation based off black artists, but largely gets associated with white people. The one thing I'll say is she said, she said this, ain't a country album it's a Beyonce album it is it's a Beyonce album it's a country album I mean it's a country album she brought in country people did songs on it's a Beyonce you're phenomenal don't get me wrong but it's a country album it's an incredible album this should finally win Beyonce album of the year I know Taylor Swift's uh Dead Poets Society or Tortured Poets Society comes out next month and I'm a big Swifty I love her as much as anyone but Listening to this, it is a work of art. It should win Beyonce the award. And I'll say, two favorite tracks right off jump. Two Most Wanted, her and Miley Cyrus. Wow, is that a rocket. I've listened to that probably 10 times already since Thursday. And then Yaya, a real sonic change after that song on the album. That one is a boatload of fun. You can't hear that and not start toe tapping, not start doing your thing. Maybe yell out a little bit, get excited. It's great stuff. Hopefully okay. you feel that way about this podcast. If you do, download, subscribe, rate, review. Thanks, and we'll talk to you tomorrow.